before we get into the lesson, I too want to join with Eric and uh, the Cone family and all that heard the announcement concerning Avery's baptism into Christ. We rejoice with them and with her. And it's wonderful to see someone make that decision. And now I will say what I usually say and made it a practice to say is that Avery will never lose unless she quits. And that's the way it is with every one of us. And thus, we're taught to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And of course, when you're baptized for the remission of your sins, you're baptized into Christ. Galatians 3 and 27. Therein, God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, being children of God, knowing our sins are forgiven, and that we are reconciled to God and justified in his sight. Truly, we are his children, members of his family, the Lord's church that the Lord purchased with his blood. So we certainly rejoice with Avery and her obedience to the gospel and our prayers for her to live the righteous life before God. Well, we continue to study in the book of John. We just finished last week the account John gave us in chapter 19 of the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says something that is why he's really writing this whole book. And really, if you go over and read his epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, especially the first one, he does the same thing. He said in verse 35, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Now there's the key to the whole thing. He is giving testimony not only of himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he's giving all these other people's testimony that Jesus of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. The Word, the eternal Word, John 1, 1 and 2, that was made flesh, and the apostles and others beheld him. And he'll say this again at the end of the book also, John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14. So we need to be mindful of the fact that when we're admonished to the inspired apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That we have here, even if you look at just these books as secular history, they are ancient books. They have come down to us from that time period. And I think you will find today that more and more of the scholars of that time period, and even those who don't believe in Christ as Son of God, will recognize the books of the Bible, and I especially am thinking of the New Testament books, as truly books of antiquity. Thus, they must be dealt with as things that did happen in past time and space, in history. And that causes us then to consider them as matters of either lying to us or representing the facts contained in them accurately. And that causes us to think and to reason, as God created us so to do. And having an honest and good heart, we know whether we do or we don't, we take the evidence, we reason with it, and we conclude just what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now, as we go with this further, we see in verse 36 and verse through verse 42, the burial of Jesus Christ. You remember it's Joseph of Arimathea, uh, a disciple of the Lord, but it makes it clear that he was one secretly because he was afraid of the Jews. 
But he had enough courage this time to ask Pilate that he could take the body of Christ away and take care of it as they normally would do. And Pilate grants him permission. So Joseph took the body. And we find then that Nicodemus, who we studied in John 3, came also. And he brought the bombing matters, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. And the scripture said it was about 100 pound weight. And then they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen wrappings with the spices. And it says that's as the custom uh, in burying, as far as the Jews are concerned. Then it tells us that in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. So this is not, the place they buried him is not very far from where he was crucified. Now, it's very interesting to note that none of this is being done in secret. It's very public. And that's very important for us to stop and think about for a minute. It won't be long before the day of Pentecost will come and the church will begin. Peter, the other apostles, will preach with the miraculous elements of the Holy Spirit involved in that. You can read of in Acts 2. And Peter makes it very clear that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, again, this being a public place where he was crucified and the garden near where he was crucified, they could have easily pointed out that, well, he's, his body's still there, but they didn't. I suggest sometimes, though we won't do it now, that you'll remember, as I said last week, that the Jews, in trying to discredit the preaching of the gospel, said, they slide through the teeth, that his disciples came by night and took the body away. Well, it's interesting that they did not try to bring the body forth and say, here he is, these fellows are lying. So by the very fact that they came up with the idea and, say, and said that the disciples have stolen his body means that they couldn't produce the body. And they're not about to admit that he was raised from the dead. So now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, on the account of the Jewish day of preparation, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So we come to the end of this chapter, and we see, that as John's reminded us, and I noted a while ago and read it to us, verse 35, why is he recording all of this? Because he wants people to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God that he is who he claimed to be, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. So according to this particular chapter, Pilate, the Roman governor, could find no cause of death in him. And of course, many Old Testament prophecies. And by the way, many prophecies the Lord himself made were fulfilled in his death on the cross. Now, of course, John, being an apostle of Christ, in writing this book is doing part of that which Christ called him to do. And he spake by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he spake as an eyewitness. And he emphatically states that his witness is true. Now, this is many years at the time John writes the Gospel of John after the events that he records took place. And no amount of persecution and what he must have seen and what we have recorded and what must have not been recorded stopped him from giving such plain, bold declaration in a book designed to circulate around. 
which meant, such as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and any other book of the New Testament, they could circulate around believers as well as unbelievers. And if it hadn't been true, somebody could have discredited it. That's not the case. So the crucifixion of the Christ had a tremendous effect upon Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Now remember, both of these are members of the Jewish Council, the Sanhedrin. They saw and considered the evidence which could not be refuted, and after this they did. Now nothing is said about them after this as to what they did with their lives. But it seemed rather obvious that in view of their important position in the Jewish council, well, they certainly have made strides forward. And here's where our human curiosity would say, well, why couldn't we have learned in the book of Acts that they obeyed the gospel or they didn't? Well, because that's not the reason these things are written is to satisfy your curiosity or mine. When you end the book of Acts, I'd like to know what all is going on with Paul immediately thereafter. But Luke did not tell us. And since all of this is God's word, then God didn't want him to, and there was no need to, as to the very reason of the Bible being produced in the first place. The Bible deals with the salvation of men's souls through Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. And it only deals with matters that were going on among men and what they did and so forth as it touches on the revelation of the gospel of Christ. Now we come to chapter 20 and the first 10 verses deal with the tomb being found empty. Now on the first day of the week, you have Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb. And she came very early because it was still dark. And let me pause here and talk about the first day of the week. I think most of us know this, but we'd do well to remember it. Jesus died on Friday. Now, the Sabbath day under the law of Moses was the seventh day of the week. But when did it begin? did not begin at midnight. It began at 6 o'clock, or as they would say, sundown. That's the reason they rushed, to get those people off the cross and have that all taken care of before the Sabbath began. So he's in the grave, all of what we would say from 6 o'clock, actually earlier than that, but we'll say... Six o'clock, which was the beginning of the Sabbath. He was buried on Friday. He was in the tomb all through what we would call Friday night, Saturday. But then the first day of the week began at six o'clock on Saturday. And of course, it began late in the evening or early night, being around six, sundown. And thus we find that Mary Magdalene is coming to the tomb before daylight on the first day of the week. Now the Jews would round off things, that is numbers. And uh, even people look at this and say, well, he wasn't in the tomb three 24-hour days. No, he didn't have to be for them. He was in the tomb on part of one day, all of one day, and part of another day. And that was three days as far as they were concerned. So we need to understand, as I've said many times, as we interpret scripture, that the truth of God does not change, but it was given 2,000 years ago into a people who are different technology, different language, different customs. And thus we must weed out the customs and the technology and all of that and bring the truth on over to us. The truth doesn't change. Customs, situations, and circumstances, and all of that do change, and they'll continue to change. 
So when she comes, it's still dark early on the first day of the week. She saw something, and it was that the stone was already rolled away from before the tomb. Now, the way they normally did those things, you had a tomb cut into the rock, and they would cut a sort of a trench light out of the rock in front of it. And they would put a stone, it looked like a grinding stone, a big wheel, into that uh, groove, and it would stay rolled back. So the opening will remain opened. And then when they put somebody in it, they roll that great stone. As I say, it's shaped like a wheel. And it's in that large groove in front of the opening. And of course, you remember that it was sealed at the request of the Jewish leaders. It had pilots on seal them, and they posted a guard there. And that's the common way it was done. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can go, unless somebody's destroyed it or something, to what's uh, called the tomb of uh, Queen Helen, who was Constantine's mother. And you can see one of those stones still in the groove and roll back, uh, allowing you to enter. And uh, I know that's the case because I went there and entered and crawl through into the tomb, and it was a monstrous-sized place with other rooms leading off from it. But that was the general way that they did things when they actually prepared a tomb to suit themselves. And um, thus, that's what you have. And when it says the stone was rolled away, then you get the idea better rather than just a big boulder rolled in front of the mouth of a cave. So Mary ran, and uh, she comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and that, of course, is the Apostle John. And she said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they laid him. I've often wondered uh, who she meant by they. But nevertheless, that's what she said. Peter and John, therefore, went to the tomb. They're running, too. John, who's younger than Peter, outran him. At least I'm supposing that's the reason that John got there first. But he stopped and looked in and didn't go into the tomb. So he stoops down, looks in, and what does he see? He sees the linen wrappings that were lying there. Simon Peter comes up, and he <laughs> I think we say he didn't slow down. He went right into the tomb and beheld the same linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth, which had covered his head. It wasn't lying with the linen wrappings, but it was uh, folded up, rolled up, however they did it in a place by itself. Now, interesting comment is made. John then went into the tomb, and he records himself that he saw and believed. Well, ask the question, what did he see? He saw nobody, but he saw the clothes that they normally wrapped a dead body in. And he believed. He believed what? He believed that the Lord had been raised from the dead. Now, up to now, they didn't understand the Scripture. All that we've read, we have to not be so hard on them because we have the whole New Testament. They didn't. And they had uh, a lot of things they had to contend with that was set in their minds. And they just didn't understand then he must rise again from the dead. Now, the, the Jews did believe in the final resurrection of all men at the end of time. That's obvious when Jesus came and raised Lazarus from the dead. You remember what was said to him by Lazarus' sister. But they didn't think about anybody rising from the dead in this way. 
That's interesting. It says now that after this happening, the disciples went away to their own homes. You, you think about that for a minute. Well, what else were they going to do? Um, Got to remember, they're still in a very precarious situation. And they do not have what we studied about that Jesus promised them. The work of the Holy Spirit with them that would come in the baptismal measure on the Pentecost, which is yet ahead of them. Now Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene when we come into the verses 11 through 18. Mary is standing outside of the tomb weeping. As she wept, the scripture brings out that she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she sees two angels. They're in white. One is sitting at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus has been lying. An interesting question. Woman, why are you weeping? That uh, question could be pondered for a long time. But look at her attitude still. She answers, because they've taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they've laid him. So you can see the connection that's here. And I would like to say this concerning John bringing up the women as to the first ones who got to the tomb is that Jewish women in that culture and not only in that culture uh, were not allowed to give testimony because they were considered not trustworthy enough give testimony in court. And you say, well, what does that have to do with, with this? Well, John knows that this is going to circulate. And if there was ever a chance of anybody wanting to doctor up anything, he just left out the fact that women first saw him because nobody's going to believe the women anyway. Even the courts want to allow their testimony. But he didn't, did he? So when uh, she had said this, she turned around and she beheld Jesus standing. But she didn't recognize him. And he asked her the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now, Jesus didn't need to ask that question because he didn't know. There are a lot of questions in the Bible that come to men. The source is God. And he does these things to make people think. There are a lot of times in teaching classes you ask questions just to see what people are thinking. Now, Mary supposed that he was the gardener. And she said, sir, if you, you've carried him away, tell me where you laid him and, and I will take him away. I, I've always chuckled at that a little bit because how she how is she going to carry a dead body? Now, she may not have had that in mind. She may have had in mind getting somebody to help her. But where would she take him? Then Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, and this is more the way the Greek reads, it, reads don't keep on cling, clinging to me, not just touch me not. But he did say, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to the brethren, say to him, I send to my Father and your Father and my God, and your God. Well, Mary came quickly and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to them. Well, this brings us down to John's record from verses 19 through 
23, where Jesus then appears to the disciples. They were sort of left on hold there. That Mary has said this to the disciples. On the same day, Jesus appears to the disciples. Same day means the first day of the week. And it was evening. The disciples were together. Doors were shut. That means they were locked. Why? Because of the fear of the Jews. Shows you more of what was on their mind. And all of a sudden, Jesus is just standing in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Of course, he shows them his hands and his side. And the disciples then begin to rejoice when they saw the Lord. I think it's interesting that he does show the nail scars in his hand and feet, this spear scar in his side. Because that means the body that died on that cross. And after the death of that body, the Roman soldiers thrust the spear in his side has been resurrected. It's the same body. And Jesus then says to them, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, then I also send you. And then symbolically, the Lord breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now that has not happened yet. It won't happen for a while. But he's reminding them of who they are, apostles of Jesus Christ. They're not equipped yet to do what he called them to do. They're getting that way in their own witnessing personally of what they've seen. But they've not yet, as I said earlier, been baptized with the Holy Spirit. But he does say, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. Well, some people read that and get the idea that, well, I guess whoever they decided to forgive, they did, and they didn't want to, they didn't have to. Uh, that misses the whole point. Only Jesus or God forgives sins. All sin that may involve other people is ultimately and finally against God. Sin's the only thing that separates somebody from God. God being a perfectly just God, something must be done so that sinners can be reconciled. There has to be a way they can be justified, and God remained a perfectly just God. And so we're seeing the process happen right here in that one of the Godhead three could become a man, be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, thus the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And as Isaiah had forecast in Isaiah 53 and other prophets had said, he would die for no sins or evil or criminal acts he did, but die on behalf of others. And thus, when we put our faith in him and the gospel system in compliance with his will, then we can be blessed by the fact that he shed his blood for the remission of all men's sins. Thus, when believers who've repented are baptized into Christ, they're immersed in water. They are buried with Christ in baptism. They're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12. In the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection, they are raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature. In what sense? Spiritually. They're reconciled to God. They are set apart. They're saints. They're children of God, members of the body of Christ, members of the Lord's church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So we're seeing this take place. Well, then why did he say this? Because it's through the apostles that he would reveal by the Holy Spirit the gospel and the totality of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. First orally, 
And by the miracle signs and wonders, the apostles did prove that the message was from heaven and not from me. And then by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, they and others who had the gift of prophecy through the laying on of the apostles' hands, such as Jude or Luke, they would write what we have as the New Testament. I say they would write. They're writing the will of Christ. That's when it's called the New Testament of Christ. But it is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. So it's Christ through the Spirit revealing the will of God, the gospel of Christ system, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, the gospel, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1, 16. And thus, these men, when they speak the truth that the Holy Spirit gives them utterance, then the sins are forgiven according to the terms of pardon that Jesus Christ through the Spirit gives to them. And that's what happens. If you want to see it demonstrated in the day the church started in Acts 2, on that first Pentecost, follow the resurrection of Christ. Now, when we come into verses 24 through 20, 29, we have another one brought, another uh, person to testify that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And that is Thomas. Jesus um, appears to Thomas because he wasn't with them. That is the disciples, the apostles, when he first appeared to them. And they wasn't believing what they were saying. And they said, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, unless I shall see his hands, and the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, the Lord somehow must have been listening in. That's a nice way to say it. Because Christ is omniscient. So after eight days, he's with the disciples again. They're inside. Thomas is with them now. Well, Jesus comes again in their midst. Although the door is shut, we might say locked. and They're still fearful of the Jews. All of a sudden, there he is standing in their midst. Well, that would get somebody's attention, it seems to me. But he gives them the same salutation. Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas and says, reach here, hither your finger and see my hands and so on and so forth about examining the evidence. Because Thomas had said, I won't believe. And immediately he says nothing but my Lord and my God. Now, obviously, his mind was logical because he saw the adequate evidence and it implied something. It implied that this body is the body of Jesus Christ to have been following for over three years. He's the one that was nailed to the cross and died on the cross was taken down and put into the tomb. It's obvious he has been raised from the dead. Now, Jesus then said to Thomas, because you've seen me, notice, you've seen me with your eyes and you have believed. He then says, well, blessed are they that have not seen with their eyes, have not had empirical evidence whereby they believe, and yet they have believed. Now that says a whole lot about what faith is. And faith is not different from believe. Believe is a verb. Faith is a noun form of the same thing. And what's being said here is 
when you have the evidence, as I said earlier in the class, that is adequate, and you reason correctly with it, you can draw a conclusion. We do it all day long, every day, and on some things, it happens so fast in our minds that we don't realize that's what we've done. But that's the way God created us. And that's why the prophet Isaiah said, come, let us reason together. God does not expect us to accept his existence without evidence, adequate evidence, credible witnesses. God does not expect us to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, except that we have witnesses and adequate evidence. John knows that, and that's why he said, I'm writing all this down. So that's an important matter to keep in mind. You know, it really hasn't changed. When you try to prove something nowadays, then you've got to try to prove the same way John did. When it comes to things you haven't seen or experienced with your five senses. And I've used this many times, and all of you mostly have heard me say it. That's the way virtually our whole jurisprudence activity operates in a court of law. We have now John's great and wonderful purpose statement that we've quoted so often. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing ye might have life through his name, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now notice that Jesus, Jesus, means Savior. Watch how when you substitute the definitions that the Savior is the anointed, the Son of God. For Christ means anointed. And that believing you may have life in his name. It's important to note that he didn't say the moment you mentally affirm that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is who he claimed to be, that you have life. It is a step that must be taken, and nobody's a Christian unless to take it. But it is never said in the scriptures that the moment a person mentally assents to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Son of God, is that person saved at that moment? It does say things like that gives you the opportunity to be saved. You remember there were priests in Christ's own earthly ministry who believed on him, but they would not confess him because they feared being put out of the synagogues. So obviously mere belief won't work if we mean by that uh, subscribing to the fact that he is the son of God. There's something else involved. And we learn about that when we come to Acts 2 and other places when people wanted to become Christians. And we find out that believers in Christ, believers who had come to their belief in Christ because of the evidence that God offered through the miracles and then that the apostles declared in the languages of all those people gathered there, their home tongues, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. But as believers, they knew they weren't saved. They were picked in their heart by the message that proved what Peter had accused them of, you have taken them to wicked hands of crucified and slain the Son of God. And all the other things that were preached by him and the other apostles. But because they were convicted of their sins, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their heart because of their sins. Their conscience was eating them alive. They wanted to know what to do to be forgiven. And he takes them as believers in Christ and tells them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And that is where John's headed. 
But you've got to get an unbelieving world to first believe that Christ is who he is, the only begotten son of God. There's no use telling a person you've got to repent of your sins, you've got to be baptized to be saved, if they don't even believe in Christ as the only begotten Son of God. So John is interested in getting that tremendously pagan world to come to belief in Jesus Christ. Now, we'll review the chapter and then the lesson will be yours. According to the chapter, this chapter, we see clearly that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God. He's declared to be the Son of God by the testimony of the empty tomb. By the clear and conclusive evidence that the body had not been stolen. I say again, thieves would not have taken time to deliberately leave and deliberately place the grave clothes, the wrappings as they were. You know, that's uh, not just taking up space when it tells us the condition of those wrappings. By the numerous specific details which could not have been concocted by deceivers. Then by the Lord's appearance to Mary, Following that, the Lord's appearance to Peter and John, and they're coming to understand the resurrection and to believe. Then by the testimony of Mary to the disciples, by his ability, Jesus, to pass through closed and locked doors, when he appeared to the disciples without Thomas, then when he appeared to the disciples when Thomas was present, and by the evidence which he himself presented to Thomas. And of course, that very magnificent, beautiful, and emphatic declaration of Thomas himself, my Lord and my God. Then lastly, by the beautiful purpose statement we quoted a while ago, of the Apostle John himself. The words of the Holy Spirit inspired Apostle and the words of an eyewitness who is writing the whole book of John so people would have the wherewithal to believe. And that's important to understand. So next week we'll continue on and I'll try to give you an idea of more studies we can do as we're nearing the end of, of the book of John. But for now, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer before we stop for the night. Our Holy Father, we're thankful for thy word. And we pray that we'll study it, meditate on it day and night. And that we will take it for what it is. Thy infallible word. Given from heaven to men to lead us to heaven. Help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We pray that all of us will help each other to go to heaven and guiding us in pathways of righteousness for thy name's sake. Help us to love the truth. Help us to love the souls of men who need the gospel. And we pray that we'll love one another as brethren to encourage each other in the things that God requires of us to be faithful to him. Guide us on now through the night. Strengthen us and bless us. Help us to ever say, not I will, but thine be done. And help us to labor with that reality in mind. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.